Welcome to Elliot Hine Network. I'm your host of Bangalore. The Washington Teachers Union has launched a major initiative called Learning Doesn't Stop Lessons on TV. Let's check out our first lesson with Camelia Keogh from McKinley Tech Middle School. Lesson 2 will be conducted by Dion Johnson from Hart Middle School. Let's see what we can learn today. Hi everyone, and welcome to this week's science segment. I'm Ms. Keo, your host. Last time we talked about gravity, and shout out to all the awesome students who use the hashtag Keo Science to show off your really awesome parachute designs. If you have your other designs from today's lesson, please use the hashtag. We love to see all the awesome work that you're doing. Today, we're gonna to be talking about thermal energy. And to get ready for that, I have here a glass of iced tea. It's been sitting out for a few minutes now, and I'm going to take a look at some observations with it. Now that I've picked it up, I actually noticed that there's a ring of water on the table, and it's also a little wet on the outside. Have you ever had this happen to you? That you have a nice cold glass of something, and then there's liquid on the outside. It makes me wonder, where did the liquid come from? Did it crawl out of my glass? Is my glass leaking? I really hope not because I just bought this glass. How could I test it? How could I even figure this out? Well, I, the, one of the ways that I could test it is I could put a lid right on top and see if that stops the liquid from going on the outside. I could also touch and maybe even taste to see if it's iced tea on the outside. We're in the middle of a pandemic and I haven't washed my hands yet, so I'm not gonna do that. But I can still make some other observations. But one of the things that I notice is that it's cold and the outside is a lot warmer. Well, this has something to do with thermal energy. Turns out there are water molecules in the air in addition to carbon dioxide and other gas molecules. Now, when the water molecules touch this cold glass, it actually cools it down and condenses it, making it stick. So the next time you're out on a picnic or having a barbecue, that water on the outside is just the water molecules from the air. No need to worry. Now, I'm not fully convinced and wanna take a little bit closer look at more stuff about thermal energy. And you can actually do this along with me at home. All you need are two cups. I have two cups here, and I'm going to take some hot water and fill it up. I'm going to fill it up about three quarters of the way. Just be careful if you're doing this on your own. And then I'm going to take some cold water. You can use this from your sink. I have some that I've put in my refrigerator for a few hours. And what I'm going to try to do is put about the same amount of water on the inside of each cup. That looks about right. Now, I'm going to make a quick prediction, taking two food coloring, which one do you think will spread out faster? What do you think will happen? Will it spread out faster or will it spread out the same? Let's take a look. I'm going to put yellow in my hot water cup and I'm going to put blue in my cold water cup. We're going to do a quick race. And tell me what you notice when I put the liquids in. Ready, set, go. One, two, three, four, five. Now, tell me, what do you see? What is happening? Remember, the yellow cup is hot water. And this cup here is cold water. What do you notice? I noticed that the yellow cup here is spread out much, much faster than this cold cup here. What does that tell you? Well, it tells us that the molecules are moving and the warmer it is, the faster that it moves. The colder it is, the slower it moves. And that's evident by how quickly they spread out. And if you can see now, this one's completely spread out, whereas this one, it's still a little bit taking its time. Very cool. 
That's actually what thermal energy is. Thermal energy is the average molecular motion. More movement, the faster it moves, the faster it spreads out. The colder it is, less energy, the slower that it spreads out. Now, it makes me start to think, does this happen only with liquids? Or does this happen with solids or gases? We're gonna do one more demonstration. Again, you can follow along. All you need for this demonstration is an empty water bottle and a cup of soap. Now, taking a look, what is inside of this water bottle? Nothing. Well, technically not nothing. There are actually gas molecules or air molecules in here. Now, take a look and tell me what you think. I'm gonna take this bottle, put it upside down into the soap until I get a little bit of a film. Now, I'm gonna put it into the hot water. Watch what happens. As I put it into the hot water, you get a huge bubble. Whoa! What happens to the air molecules there? They're actually starting to expand. Watch what happens. Whoops. If the bubble pops, you can always refill it. Let's see what happens when we go back in the hot water. We get our nice big bubble. And now watch what happens when I put it in the cold water. The bubble starts to go down. This is contracting, expanding, contracting. Ooh, and the bubble popped again. You get the point. So hot water not only makes molecules move faster, it also causes it to expand. Putting it in cold water makes these gas molecules and the molecules inside of the cup contract, starts moving slowly, contraction, faster, expansion. Now, does this all make sense? Think about it. If you're sitting there, spinning, you know, dancing, jamming along, using a little bit of energy, you're not taking much space, not using a lot of energy. But if your song comes on, you start dancing, lots of feet, moving around, lots of energy, taking up more space, right? So more energy, more movement, more space. That all has to do with thermal energy. Now, does this have anything to do with heat? Isn't heat thermal energy? Turns out they're related. Heat is actually thermal energy moving from something that's hot to something that's cold. I'm gonna go ahead and put these cups away so I don't spill them. Now, there are three ways in which heat can be transferred. Conduction, convection, and radiation. Here are all the three ways. Conduction, well, conduction is basically by contact. If I'm gonna take my nice warm cup of cold food coloring water and hold it, it's nice and warm. By conduction and direct contact, the heat from the cup is getting transferred to my hand. Nice and warm. Hmm. Or sometimes I like to do my hair and um, I have here a hair straightener or a flat iron. I already know to touch the bottom because the top part has two metal plates. And if I touch that, we already know you're probably going to burn your hand, right? You're not going to touch it directly with your hand because by conduction, it's hot. So I can use it on my hair. And by direct contact, it's heating up my hair here. And it gets kind of hot, right? That is conduction. Direct contact, direct heat transfer from hot to cold. Now, there's another way, convection. Convection is a little bit more difficult. It's heat transfer through movement of warm air. I don't know if you heard that, but this blow dryer right here, I'm not touching it directly because that's completely hot, but my hair gets warmed by the warmed matter coming out of it, just like a radiator. Another place that you could see it is actually when water is boiling. 
it starts to move very quickly and the water starts to move and that's warmed matter. The last one has a really bad reputation. The bad reputation, well, it says radiation. It's not terrible for you. In fact, you could get warmed from the sun, too much sun, not that, pretty bad, but it can still warm you up. But radiation can also come from a light bulb. When you were in elementary school, you probably had some chicks that were warmed up by a light bulb. Now, based on what I just told you with conduction, you don't wanna touch it because if you touch it directly, that's gonna be hot. So you can always touch it from a safe distance. See where I'm going? So why do I care? Well, what I really do care about is heat transfer. Why do I care about it? Well, I wanna slow it down sometimes and sometimes I wanna speed it up. So if I'm going to go bake some cookies, I definitely wanna put it in a metal pan because it's gonna heat it up a lot faster, right? I'm not gonna put it in some sort of, um, let's say oven, inside of an oven mitt because that's not gonna cause it to heat up. Or if you're like me, I like to bring my lunch. I like things that are nice and cold, like my salad or some yogurt or even just a cold drink. So which one should I put it in? This lunch bag or this lunch bag or this one? Well, this one here is lined quite nicely. I know this one's a little bit more convenient, but this one here is a little bit better insulator. Insulator slows down and reduces heat transfer. If you were gonna go to the beach, you probably wanna put your cool drinks in here, not in here. So this, this brings me to our next challenge. I want you to create a thermal cup to reduce and slow down heat transfer, either conduction, convection, or radiation. Now, go around your house, find some things, explore some materials. What I'm going to do, I'm gonna grab two cups. And the reason why it's two is so that we can have one as a control to compare our data to. The second one here is going to be my design. I'm going to go ahead, wrap it up with some paper towels and stick it in to here. You could use newspaper, tin foils, maybe some old rags. Send us your designs and use the hashtag KeoScience so we can see all the cool stuff that you're coming up with. And maybe you'll get hired by a really awesome, cooler company. I don't know. So I'm going to take my tea. And the way I'm going to test it, I don't have a thermometer here, but I am going to pour a little bit of tea in one, and then I'm going to pour some in the other. Now, I want to make sure they're a little bit equal. And what I'm going to do is check in on it. Every few minutes, I'm going to try to see, did this one stay cool longer? than this one. If it does, that means my design worked really well. Test it out. You could also use hot water, whatever it is. See which one doesn't change temperature the longest. Test out your designs and send it to us so we can take a look and we'd love to share what you've done. Now, thank you so much for joining us today on our science segment. I'm your host, Ms. Keo. For more information about this lesson and other lessons, please visit www.wtu6local.net. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next time. Well, good morning, my middle school learners. Welcome back. My name is Deion Johnson, and I'm an English instructor at Charles Hart Middle School. This week, we are going to be discussing note-taking strategies. I'm sure you're wondering why we're even talking about this. Well, let's consider, as you're sitting at home reading several documents in one sitting, it can be hard to remember all of that information. It can also be difficult for you by the time you get to your culminating task that will require you to actually use all of the information that you probably just got done annotating. So this, this is where note-taking strategies along the way and afterwards can come in handy. And that's exactly why we have to talk about this. 
Throughout the school year and throughout your middle school career, you have been taught how to annotate the text while you read. Annotating is an active reading strategy. It allows you to take and highlight, underline key information and place that information in the margins. Now this helps you to construct meaning and process what it is while you're reading so you're not being a passive reader, meaning you're not just reading and just taking information in and by the time you get done, you have no idea what it is that you read. By annotating, you're able to make sense of the information that you've read, which is a great, great active reading strategy. However, it's the next step that we want to talk about today. It's that taking all of the information and looking at all of that information that you've underlined, that we now need to do something with it so that it's not just accessible to you by recall, but it's now locked into your memory and you can apply it to other subject areas and through the duration of the rest of your education. So today we're going to look at four different strategies that you can use. That's right, my favorite number, four different strategies that you can use in order to assist you in the process. Outlining it's a strategy that uses numbers, letters, or even Roman numerals to identify and classify information based on levels of importance. The most important pieces of information are categorized as headings, and then supporting or less significant information is listed beneath that particular heading in order of importance or relationship. For this demonstration, I'm going to use the eighth grade text. Looking at the 8th grade text, Beyond Resistance, Youth Activism and Community Change by Jay Tilton, we are going to use both our annotation skills as well as our understanding of an outline. And over here we have the header and then the key points underneath, and these are Roman numerals that we're using for the outline in particular. So let's go ahead and dive into the first paragraph itself. As hundreds of young people descended on Oakland City Hall in August 2002, they chanted in unison, You can't stop the power of the youth, because the power of the youth won't stop. Confronting Mayor Jerry Brown's decision to spend nearly $70 million to hire 100 police officers to patrol Oakland's underfunded schools, young people collectively forced the city to allocate $7 million to youth programs throughout the city. Youth activism has always played a central role in the democratic process and continues to forge new grounds for social change. Young people's participation in movements in South Africa to end apartheid, in China's infamous Tiananmen Square, in the hills of Chiapas, Mexico to bring greater sovereignty to indigenous people all remind us how young people struggle for justice against all odds. One lesson we draw from these movements is that young people are agents of social change. It is precisely this notion of agency that gives rise to important democratic movements throughout our history. So if we go back to our strategy of annotating, as I was reading, the following things would have been highlighted. Oakland City Hall in August 2002 lets me know exactly the date and the location. Um, we know that the students are involved and they're confronting the mayor on his decision to spend $70 million and they want it reallocated to youth programs. And we know that history has taught us and historically um, movements have taken place by youth uh, throughout the world. So in Mexico, South Africa, and China. So this all points to the idea that young people are agents of social change. So if I was to utilize this information and place it inside of my outline, it would go as follows. So I know that my major topic is youth activism and community change. An example of that that I'm pulling is that this took place in Oakland City Hall, August 2002. I'm noting who was involved. It was the youth versus Mayor Jerry Brown and exactly what it is that they wanted. So I am taking all of this information and condensing it or synthesizing it so that I can then later just quickly glance at my notes in order to be able to answer questions or make an argument if I'm in a discussion or to be able to go back and look specifically at areas that I want to pull evidence from if I were writing an essay. Okay, Maybe an outline is something that you don't want to do um, or you don't want to spend a lot of time with or it just doesn't really work for you. There are other ways. So let's go ahead and look at strategy number two. Now, strategy number two is a bit different. It doesn't involve creating 
a whole laundry list of information. Instead, you would be diagramming, okay? So in this case, it's an alternative method and it works for visual representation. So for my visual learners, those of you that like to look at um, pictures or images and associate meaning or construct meaning with those images, okay? So in this case, you are identifying the relationships between concepts and content together. When looking at both the sixth and the seventh grade text for this week, I know that you all are both talking about the hero's journey. So in the text for sixth grade, this information has been provided, right? This is, I've taken an excerpt out of the reading. Now within this reading, there's a lot of information that could be pulled out. So I wanna just go ahead and highlight it. So we know that a monomyth is a hero's, is known as the hero's journey. There are three stages of it, separation, initiation, and return. It includes a symbolic death or rebirth of the character, this idea of transform, transforming from old to new that then is equated to the character arc and it's commonly common and in day into a region of supernatural wonder. And eventually the superhero comes back from the adventure with the power to help his fellow man, okay? So if I were just trying to process this information and I'm a visual learner, this might not work. I, I don't really fully grasp or have an understanding of exactly what is being um, discussed or told. However, I could go about creating a diagram or looking to see if a diagram or infographic is already created. In this case, you are provided with the following diagram, right? So all of the information that was just shared of how exactly these different steps of the hero's journey take place, as we can see, it's a cyclical process, is now pieced together in our diagram here. Now it's just a matter of making sure that we know how to read the notes themselves and or adding information along the way to help you remember the different stages. All right, let's go ahead and move on to strategy number three, which is also a visual aid, which is considered to be mind mapping. Now, mind mapping can be done on paper. It can also be done online, on your phone. Um, it is a very simple and quick way to process your notes um, in the event that you're not an artist or a doodler. Um, so in this case, we use bubbles, we use lines, boxes, or other visual markers uh, to represent relationships, sequence, and importance. For this, I have taken the information that we learned from the seventh grade text as well, um, part of the hero's journey information, and added it um, to our slides. So in chapter 15, we're looking at morality. And morality is based upon the values of an individual. It focuses on the way an individual chooses to behave. Um, it is based on actions, not a theory of behavior. So it is up to an individual to decide the moral code that they will abide by, okay? So if I wanted to make sure I understood the differences between the two concepts, I, cre I could create my mind map. So... And I've already gone ahead and created it. So in the center, I would put that I'm looking at a hero's journey. And then I would want to branch out with our first term, which is culture. From there, I would want to start using the notes that I highlighted so that culture is values and morality are seen different. Um, but it depends on the culture itself. Um, culture being the country, the region, or the time period, but not limited to. I also know that when it discussed culture, that it talked about embodying the ideals of a society um, and its values and morals themselves. Okay. I also could have discussed um, and brought out values, which was the principles or standards or behaviors that are subjective and individuals' beliefs. Um, in this case, we're also looking at morality. It goes beyond identifying things as good or wicked, and it focuses on the way an individual pretty much chooses to behave on their own, which is very different um, in a sense. 
So in this case, I know the hero journey talks about culture, morality, and values, which is what the essay topic is then going to discuss. So I would then build out my notes around those three items specifically. So ultimately, my final product would look like this. So I have values here and what a value it is. We have the hero's journey. If I wanted to break down what exactly a hero's journey is or some examples so I can remember morality over here, culture over here, and just as an extra, you know, visual aid to put in or memory cue, I put in the hero's journey chart just to help me um, remember. Let's go on to our fourth and last strategy which is the split page. So for this strategy, you would just literally take a paper and either draw three lines or fold it into three columns, and you would collect information from the reading um, based off of the evidence. Uh, and this would help you if you were answering the culminating test or an essay question. So going back to that eighth grade text, um, my paper would be broken up into three sections. Um, in this case, in favor of or against, and then in the middle, I would keep this blank until after I've collected my evidence, okay? I'd use this page in order to write my essay. Um, but of course, I would have to make sure that I've annotated in the beginning and then, you know, synthesize and organize those notes afterwards. Now, please keep in mind that you do not need to use all of the strategies. However, they all can be used depending on your style and the subject matter in which you are studying. Uh, however, your best option is just to figure out which way works best for you, if you prefer the visual aids, if you prefer the evidence collectors, um, that is completely up to you. I also want to point out that previously there was a video conducted by the WTU of one of the instructors teaching you all the Cornell Notes method. That strategy along with this strategy can all be found and located on the WTU Local 6 net website. Make sure you go there and you revisit these strategies. They are definitely effective and they'll definitely assist you in note taking and your learning abilities.